Income Tax 2023-2024, American Opportunity Credit, who can claim a dependent's expenses? Get ready and some coffee, because tax season's the time when we test out our math skills and our sanity. Two plus two does not equal five. I don't care what this tax form says. Dang new tax form, probably written by a DEI hire or something. It's ridiculous. Most of this information can be found in publication 970 Tax Benefits for Education Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement ending with taxable income instead of net income, taxable income, therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. But it's only half the story. We've got the second half down here, taking taxable income, calculating the tax on that, not with a flat tax, but with a progressive tax to get to the tax before credits and other taxes. We then have the credits and other taxes, other taxes, including things like self-employment tax for sole proprietorship schedule C uh, items, for example, and then the credits acting similar to deductions in that they're both good for taxes, but if you had a dollar deduction, it would be a decrease to the income statement part of the formula, lowering taxable income, only getting a benefit from that dollar deduction based on the tax brackets that we are in. Whereas if we get a dollar credit, we might get the full benefit of that dollar credit if and we're in the upper non-refundable credits at this point, we have enough tax liability to consume it because the credit up here can't take the tax liability below zero. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a tax system, but a welfare safety net uh, type of system or program. That gives us the total tax. Then we have the payments and refundable credits. Payments such as withholdings from W-2s, estimated tax payments, Refundable credits are those credits that can take us below zero, therefore not acting as a tax, but as a welfare or benefit safety net program, finally getting to the tax refund or tax due. This is the form 1098T. So typically when we're talking about education credits, we're, work, we're looking at an institution where the, the government has their claws in that institution. First, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Somehow, usually because the institution is either getting money directly from the government or indirectly through the financing of the students in the form of student loans. And because the students want to be able to take these kind of education credits, of course, as a form of tax incentive and therefore the institutions uh, have to issue this 1098T and the IRS can kind of force them to do that. So we should be receiving then the 1098T as an indication that at least we went to an eligible institution to possibly take one of the credits. 
or if not that, a deduction, although the amount on this 1090AT may not always exactly match what we're going to be using to calculate the credit because we have might have other factors involved, such as scholarships, and we might have uh, books and supplies and whatnot that we're dealing with as well. So then we have the Education Credits Form 8863, American Opportunity Credit, Lifetime Learning Credit. They're two separate credits, but you could almost think of them as one credit bundle at this point in time, because typically we're going to be looking for the American Opportunity Credit first, because it's bigger, although more restrictive. And then if we can't get that, we go for the non-refundable credit. Typically, if we can't get either of those, possibly we look for a deduction that we can take somewhere if that would be possible. This is the Schedule 3, Additional Credits and Payments, Part 1, Non-Refundable Credits, Line 3, Education Credits from Form 8863. This is the non-refundable credits. Here's the second page of the Form 1040 where in the tax and credits section we see line 20 amounts from the schedule three that are rolling in and with the refundable components they come directly if there is a refundable component the, these are the amount of the credits that might go below zero it would go to line 29 directly american opportunity credit uh, from form 8863 line eight all right so now we're looking at who can claim a dependence expenses so we've determined that uh, what a student is basically, what does it mean to have education expenses? How do we do those calculations? Now we're looking at who can claim a dependence expenses. So if there are qualified education expenses for dependents during a tax year, either you or your dependent, but not both of you can claim an American Opportunity Credit for your dependence expenses for that year. So we're just reiterating at this point the idea that you can't have multiple people claiming the benefits of the same expenses for the same student, the same social security number. So for example, if we have a student, possibly that student can be older and still claimed as a dependent because the age limits sometimes change uh, or increase for being able to qualify for a dependent. So that would mean that if they file their own tax return, then then we can't have them be able to get the benefits from the expenses for education credit as well as their parent, for example. That would be a form of basically double dipping. So for you to claim an American Opportunity Credit for your dependent's expenses, you must also claim your dependent on your tax return. So back to this idea of who's gonna get the benefit of this person. It's kind of like the same idea as when, when you have a dependent and who's gonna get the, the child for the child tax credit. If, if you have like a custody situation or something like that where the two parents are trying to claim the child because the child is so valuable in terms of taxes. And so they're trying to claim the child and obviously the one usually who is able to claim the child as a dependent is going to be the one that's going to possibly get the tax benefits such as the child tax credit and possibly changing the status of the household and so on and so forth similarly here you would think that although they're we're looking at a different kind of credit now education credit the person who's claiming the person who had the education on their return is the one that might get the benefit Usually that's not a custody issue between the two parents at this point in time, hopefully, but possibly there's an issue between the parent and the child who's trying to become independent at this point in time, possibly wanting to file their own tax return, but that might not be beneficial from a financial standpoint, given the fact that they don't make any money, probably aren't make, paying much taxes because they're a full-time student. Therefore, it might be more beneficial to report them on their parents' tax return still, and then the parent, because they're claiming that as, them as a dependent, you would think would get the benefit of the credit. So you do this by listing your dependent's name and other required information on Form 1040 or Form 1040-SR. So if you can claim on your tax return a dependent who is an eligible student, then only you can claim the American Opportunity Credit based on that dependent's expenses. The dependent can't claim the credit. So oftentimes you, you end up sometimes in the situation where like the child who's a grown like adult now, man, woman, they, they want to be independent, but they're not quite there yet, of course, because it takes a little bit longer these days, especially if 
you're trying to do a, a student, you know, go to school and whatnot. So you have to communicate between the two individuals and try to say, okay, what's the best thing to do from a tax based situation? Is it still best to claim you as a dependent on the parent's tax return or on on your tax return and then make sure again that we don't have this problem of trying to kind of double dip claiming the dependent on both tax returns or claiming as a dependent on the parent and the, the child also files a tax return as though they're not claimed as a dependent and then you end up with this kind of double dipping situation which will just confuse the irs which will cause us a bunch of problems so if you don't claim on your tax return a dependent who is an eligible student even if entitled to claim the dependent then uh, only the dependent can claim the credit the american opportunity credit you can't claim the credit based on this dependent's expenses so even though in this situation you possibly could have claimed them because they would qualify but you decided not to for whatever reason now of course it would be the, the the dependent could file the tax return and claim the credit now they might not get as much of a benefit if they would have qualified as a dependent because they might not be earning that much income therefore they might not get the full benefit of the credit because a large part of the credit is the non-refundable part although there is that bit that is a refundable component where they might get a benefit from that, right? So expenses paid by dependent. So if you claim on your tax return an eligible student who is your dependent, treat any expenses paid or deemed paid by your dependent as if uh, you had paid them. So just to reiterate this situation, remember that you have this distinction between who made the actual payments to the college and who gets to claim the credit. Because you might say, hey, look, if the dependent is the one that actually made the check, wrote the check to the college, then how is it the fact that the parent is the one that gets to basically take the benefits of the dependent? And so notice it's not really coming down to who wrote the actual check. It's coming down to who is being claimed as a dependent because the idea is that that's that's the person who should get the benefit because they're the ones that are probably taking care of most of the expenses for the child we saw the other another situation where like a, a rich uncle or, or maybe the uncle's not that rich but the uncle for whatever reason paid for the education to the college the uncle clearly cannot take the the deduction because the kid is in no way going to be on the uncle's return if they're on the parent's return or if they're on their own return. So it wouldn't make sense to just lose the benefit just because the uncle didn't properly funnel the cash through to the parent and then the parent paid the college, right? The uncle paid the college directly and that shouldn't mean that you lose the credit entirely just because of the flow of the cash flow you would think and that's the idea. So include these expenses when figuring the amount of your American Opportunity Credit. So expenses paid by you. So if you claim a dependent who is an eligible student, only you can include any expenses you paid when figuring the amount of the American Opportunity Credit. If neither you nor anyone else claims the dependent, only the dependent uh, can include any expenses you paid when figuring the American Opportunity Credit. So similar situation, once again, if you claim a dependent who is an eligible student, so now you're claiming them as a dependent, only you can include any expenses you paid when figuring the amount. Obviously, because they're on your return, the payments were still made by you. And But if neither you nor anyone else claims the dependent, only the dependent. So now, the, obviously, again, they're not on your return. Now the dependent, the one that actually went to the school, even though the parent paid for it, only the dependent can include uh, any expenses you paid when figuring the American Opportunity Credit. Expenses paid by others, someone other than you, your spouse, or your dependents, such as that rich or not so rich uncle, just the kind hearted uncle paying for the education. Such as a relative or former spouse may make a payment directly to an eligible educational institution to pay for an eligible student's qualified education expenses. So again, obviously the uncle can't take the, the benefit of making the payments to the school because they're clearly not going to be claiming the child as a dependent on their return in any case, even though they're the ones that made the payment directly to the school. 
So in this case, the student is treated as receiving the payment from the other person and in turn paying the institution. If you claim the student as a dependent on your tax return, you are considered to have paid the expenses. So again, it basically comes down to whoever's claiming the dang kid on the return is the bottom line, possibly is the one that can get the benefits of claiming the expenses to get the deduction, no matter who's the one that actually wrote the check to the financial or educational institution. Example, so in 2023, Todd's grandparent makes a payment directly to an eligible educational institution for Todd's qualified education expenses. What a nice gesture by the grandparent. So for purposes of claiming an American Opportunity Credit, Todd is treated as receiving the money from the grandparent and in turn paying the qualified education expenses. So note what you can imagine if they didn't do this, what would actually have to happen? You'd say, oh, the grandma paid the college directly and therefore you lose the credit entirely. And therefore you have to have the grandma pay the student as a gift and then the student pays for the college, right? It's just a logistical, but you don't have to do that, they're saying, because that would be, you know, you're not gonna lose the credit if grandma pays directly to the college is the idea. Unless Todd is claim now you might still get into situations, is that a gift or not? And what does she have to do with gift and estate taxes and stuff? That's kind of another issue, but that's not what we're doing here. So unless Todd is claimed as a dependent on someone else's 2023 tax return, only Todd can use the payment to claim an American Opportunity Credit. So if he's claiming himself at, on the tax return, he can take those expenses into consideration calculating the credit. So if anyone such as Todd's parents, though, claim Todd on their 2023 tax return, I think that's probably the case. Todd's, we like Todd, but he, I don't think he's self-sufficient currently at this point in time. He's got some problems, you know, but I'm just kidding. So anyway, whoever, uh, uh, claim, so the parents are claiming Todd uh, may be able to use the expenses to claim an American Opportunity Credit. If anyone else claims Todd, Todd can't claim an American Opportunity Credit. So if his parents are claiming him as a dependent and the money was paid by the grandparent, then you're basically saying the parent is the one that might be able to get the benefit. Tuition reduction. When an eligible educational institution provides a reduction in tuition to an employee of the institution or spouse or dependent child of an employee, the amount of the reduction may or may not be taxable. All right, if it is taxable, the employee is treated as receiving a payment of that amount and in turn paying it to the educational institution on behalf of the student. All right, let's think about this one more time. So when an eligible educational institution provides a reduction in tuition to an employee, so now you have somewhat of an unusual situation where an employee working at a financial institution is getting a reduction in the cost of the education for that institution. That you would think is a form of compensation. And the question is, does it qualify as a benefit or not? In other words, is it something that has to be taxable included in box one, for example, of the W-2? If it's included as income in box one of the W-2 and they and they basically are showing, then, then the person's gonna be paying taxes on it. And you would expect then it would be similar to the institution having paid the employee who then took that money and gave it back to the institution. It's kind of like a withholding, right? They just basically withheld the money that was paid by the actual person. But if they don't have to pay taxes on it, they get a tax benefit from it. That would be similar to, for example, it's not included in box one, which would be kind of like they got a deduction for it already. That would be similar to if you had to include it in income and then you got a deduction for it rather than a credit. So that would be, that would be similar to that kind of situation, which means you already got a benefit from it which means if you also count that as expenses towards like a credit or other deduction, that would be like a form of double dipping. So provides reduction to an employee of the institution or spouse or dependent child. The amount of the reduction may or may not be taxed. So if it is taxable, the employee is treated as receiving a payment of that amount and in turn paying it to the educational institution on behalf of the student. So for more information on tuition reductions, you can see qualified tuition reduction in chapter one.